Good morning. Welcome to the July 2017 Public Safety News Conference. My name is Trey Mayo. I'm the Fire Chief of the City of Winston-Salem. Today you'll hear presentations from the Winston-Salem Fire Department and then we'll be followed by uh, presentations from the Winston-Salem Police Department. And the first thing I'd like to do this morning is recognize the three line of duty deaths uh, the Winston-Salem Fire Department has suffered uh, during the month of July. And uh, I'll mention it was brought to my attention that the City of Winston-Salem Fire Department has suffered more line of duty deaths than any other fire department in the state of North Carolina with the exception of Charlotte. On July 14, 1915, Firefighter Jonah D. Kaiser, who was assigned to Engine 10, uh, I'm sorry, assigned to Engine 2, was killed in the line of duty at the age of 22. At approximately 7.30 p.m., a pool box was activated at the corner of North Liberty and West 4th Streets. Initial arriving companies found a small fire at Miller's Tailor Shop. Crews forced entry into the building and, and identified the problem as an electrical failure of an iron. In an attempt to disconnect the power to the iron, Firefighter Kaiser came into contact with some bare wires and was electrocuted. Kaiser left behind a wife whom he had married just a year, a year earlier. <clears throat> Firefighter David L. Revis, who was assigned to Engine 1, was killed exactly five years later on July 14, 1920. Shortly before midnight, pool box 14 was activated and Engine 1 responded. Uh, I should have made this bigger. <clears throat> At the intersection of Liberty and Fifth, a car pulled into the intersection in front of the engine. The engine's driver swerved to avoid the collision, and the engine spun out of control in the intersection, which was still wet from street cleaning, and slid approximately 500 feet before coming to a stop. Firefighter Revis was one of three firefighters thrown from the engine, and he succumbed to his injuries. The box alarm was determined to be false and the er errant car's driver was never identified. Firefighter Rebus was 27 years old and left behind a wife and two children, one of whom was just six weeks old. Fire Chief Arnold Bullard died on duty from a heart attack on May 5th, 1980 at approximately 4.45 p.m. while assisting with training new public safety officers. He collapsed at the Public Safety Training Center CPR was started immediately, but Chief Bullard was pronounced dead about 45 minutes later. Chief Bullard was probably the most respected fire chief in the fire department's history, and Central Fire Station on Marshall Street is named uh, in his honor. Uh, now, if you will, uh, pause with me a moment to remember these three uh, line of duty deaths. Thank you. So I, I stood up here uh, before you last month and uh, asked for your assistance. I'm talking to the media now. Uh, asked for your assistance in helping us promote the frequency and the dangers from cooking fires. And I only got one taker. That was Spectrum. Uh, since I was up here before you last month, uh, we've had 17 fires, building fires, uh, which is about one every 39 hours. Six of those, or 35 percent, uh, resulted from unattended cooking. Uh, from those uh, six cooking fires, uh, seven people were put out of their homes and one person was hospitalized. So, you know, I ask you again, where is the outrage? You know, where are the cries for action? Um, you know, why, why is this okay? Why is it okay? Why are we more concerned with how Amelia Earhart died 80 years ago than we are with what's killing firefighters and American civilians right now in 2017? I, I, I don't understand. I can't get my mind around it. Uh, so I'm going to ask you again. I'm asking for the media's help. I want you to help us put the risk and frequency of cooking fires in front of the public's eye every night at 6 o'clock with the same fervor that you want to tell us who got shot in the last 12 hours. And I'll remind you, as I've told you before, 
Fires kill more Americans every year than all other natural disasters combined, and fire kills more Americans every day than random acts of gun violence. Oh, come on, folks, get in the game. Focus on the facts, not on the fear. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Captain Chris Belcher. He's going to talk about heat injuries. And then following Captain Belcher will be fire and life safety educator Sabrina Stowe. She's going to talk about the Citizens Fire Academy that's upcoming. And uh, then after uh, Ms. Stowe, Chief Roundtree will come up from the police department. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. As we get into the hotter months of the year, we typically see a rise in heat injuries as well as heat-related deaths. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about some of those heat-related injuries as well as some prevention tips. Uh, we'll start off with uh, some types of heat injuries. First of all, of all we'll talk about uh, the uh, heat cramps. Uh, basically, heat cramps, a little background about it, uh, you know, that's when you have painful muscle cramps that occur. Uh, this typically occurs due to a loss of sodium in the body or the muscles specifically. Uh, next would be heat exhaustion. Some of the things you see with that uh, is headaches, dizzy, nausea, weakness, uh, and some heavy sweating. <coughs> this is when the person's typically uh, getting to the point where uh, they've been outside too long, the sodium levels are dropping in the body, and they're becoming dehydrated. And then last but not least is heat stroke. Uh, this is a considered a life-threatening emergency. Um, basically, these people have gotten to a point where their body stops sweating. It can't cool itself, and some of the things you'll see is confusion, loss of consciousness, seizures, and even possibly death. With that being said, there's some prevention things that you can do to help uh, stop those things or prevent those things. One of them we're going to start off with is stay cool. Wear the appropriate clothing. If you're outside, you're working out, uh, you're working in the yard, uh, wear the appropriate clothing, being lightweight, light colored, loose fitting clothing. Uh, when you're working outside, you know, if you work outside 15, 20 minutes, take a 15, 20 minute break. Get in the shade, get in the air conditioning, uh, utilize sunscreen, and be sure and pace yourself. Uh, next is staying hydrated. This is probably the most important thing you can do. If you're going to work out, make sure you hydrate the day before. Start hydrating the day before. Uh, we always tell our guys one of the things that, that we preach to them is if, they're no, if they know they're going into shift this morning, they need to start hydrating the day before. Uh, so drinking plenty of fluids and those being water and sports drinks. Uh, try to avoid your caffeine drinks, alcohol, things like that. Uh, if you're going to utilize sport drinks, it's recommended that you mix it half and half with water. Uh, the other thing is stay informed. Watch your local news, check the weather, and plan your day. Uh, plan according to the weather. You know, if you typically work out in the afternoon during the hottest time of the day, you may want to change it up and work out in the morning. Uh, let me go back one. One thing I will say, uh, children and elderly uh, people, they typically are more easily affected by the heat, uh, so they're more susceptible. Uh, so let's keep that in the back of your mind. Next, we'll talk about heat stroke for kids. Uh, this, we see this all the time, and typically on average, uh, 11 months out of the year, you typically see uh, you know, heat stroke deaths involving children, and that's across the U.S., um, and those months vary. Uh, the child's body typically heats up three times faster, and, you know, we go out like in on these hot days like this week that we're having, and you go get in your car, imagine that child in that car and, and uh, affected by that heat. Uh, most of those deaths, they occur due, uh, due to distracted parents. Uh, you know, they're distracted from making phone calls or whatever they're doing. Uh, so when they get out of the car, you know, it just doesn't sit in their mind. So one of the things that... Uh, 
they came up with was this ACT acronym, and that's avoiding heat stroke related uh, injury and death by not leaving the child alone in the car. The other thing is being sure that once you get out of your car and your child's in the car, especially like at home, lock the, make sure the car is locked up so the kids don't climb in the car and then end up locking, locking or getting stuck inside. Uh, next is C, which creates uh, reminders. Uh, you can do this by putting stuff that when you get done driving, you get to your destination and you get ready to get out of the car, you know you got to get your purse, you know you got to get your cell phone or, or, or your wallet, something like that. So it makes you get in the back of the car or check the back of the car. And then T is take action. If you see a child locked in a car, be sure and call 911, especially, you know, days like today. Uh, we just recently had one as recently as yesterday where a child was locked in a vehicle on a hot day like today. So remember that uh, acronym ACT. And if, does anybody have any questions on any of that? Okay, not sure. Good morning. Um, just want to talk to you a little bit about um, the Citizens Fire Academy. We do hold this each year. Um, we're still accepting, accepting applications for the program. It will be held on Mondays, um, 6 to 8 p.m., beginning on August 7th, and that will go through September 25th. We'll be taking applications up through the 25th, excuse me, up to the 21st um, of this month. So if anyone is interested in learning more about the fire department, how we operate, um, also do some some great home safety activities as well. We'll be talking about the stovetop fire stops, the smoke alarms, um, helping people to understand the importance of why they need to have these items, show them how to install those items as well, um, and also doing a lot of activities that are parallel to what we do as firefighters. So it's a very interesting course for not only our residents who just want to learn a bit more about the department itself, but it also, um, Ladies and gentlemen who are interested in becoming firefighters, it's a great way to learn what we do and to get in and get some information that might be useful for you as well. And if there are not any questions, I'll turn everything over to uh, Police Chief Barry Roundtree. <coughs> Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I'm Chief Roundtree of the winston Salem Police Department. Uh, before I get started, I do want to take this opportunity again to thank all the women and men of the Winston Salem Police Department for what you do every day to ensure that we have a safe city and people can enjoy the city of Winston Salem as safely as possible. Uh, before we get to our topics of the month, uh, as customary, I do want to open by honoring uh, Winston Salem police officers who have lost their lives while serving in the line of duty during the month of July. This month, we want to honor Police Officer Russell Mark Willingham, Jr. Uh, end of watch was Saturday, July the 30th, uh, 2011. The cause of death was an automobile accident. Officer Willingham was responding to assist another police officer when he was involved in a single vehicle accident in the 1700 block of Bargrave Street. Officer Willingham died on the scene due to injuries he sustained during the automobile accident. Let us all pause for a moment as we remember and honor Officer Willingham and all other police officers who have lost, lost their lives while serving during the month of July. Let us pause for a moment. Thank you. Uh, our topics for today uh, will include summertime fun, uh, don't drink and drive, that will be presented by uh, police officer uh, Hanks, as well as Sergeant uh, Krawczak. And then I will come back up with a few WSPD uh, event reminders. Officer Hawks. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, again, I'm Officer Timothy Hanks with the Winston-Salem Police Department. I'm currently assigned to the Forsyth County Driving While Impaired Task Force. I'm here to speak with you this morning about the costs uh, of driving while impaired within our community, 
our state and our nation and also what we're doing as an agency uh, to uh, counteract uh, those effects. Um, the stats themselves, uh, spe they, they speak, uh, first of all, the most important topic obviously is the human toll. Uh, that can never be um, discounted. Unfortunately, still uh, today, uh, we're still losing around 10,000 Americans annually as a result of someone calls, uh, choosing to operate a vehicle while they're impaired. Uh, the stats for this is just for alcohol impairment only. It doesn't include those drivers that were also impaired on drugs. Uh, in 2015, the year that we have the most uh, recent data from, 10,265 Americans lost their lives. That's over 28 per day. Um, in North Carolina, 415 people lost their life in 2015 as a result of a crash involving an impaired driver, uh, someone impaired on alcohol. That represented 30 percent of all statewide traffic fatalities. Uh, the injuries that occurred as a result of alcohol impaired drivers uh, were 8,244 uh, in the state of North Carolina. As I'm sure you're aware, to date here in Winston-Salem, we've had 19 traffic fatalities. Um, of those, 11 involved alcohol and drugs um, being factors in those collisions. Uh, that number is unacceptable, um, and we are concerned about it, and we are actively um, seeking to reduce that number uh, through engagement and also enforcement. As compared to last year, we had had traffic, uh, seven traffic fatalities in 2016. Uh, alcohol and drugs were determined to be factors in four of those. The economic cost of driving while impaired uh, problem within our nation. In 2010, the estimated economic cost of alcohol impaired driving was 44 billion dollars. Uh, those factors include medical, um, legal and criminal justice costs, uh, the loss of uh, productivity, people being out of the workforce, losing their jobs because of injury or because of the punishment that they receive. Insurance costs, that's something that we all bear the burden of whenever someone has a, has a crash. Um, we all pay into insurance premiums to have cover our automobiles. Uh, and also the health costs that are associated with the injuries that occur in these crashes. And also the property damage uh, costs are factored into that calculation. We want everyone to know that deep driving while impaired is a choice. It's an, it goes back to the individual. They're choosing to engage in this behavior. Uh, in Winston-Salem, we've uh, had this initiative uh, telling people to choose their ride carefully. We want people to make the choice prior to going out to have a plan. They can choose a taxi. Uh, if they don't choose a taxi, if they, don't, they can have ride share. They can call a friend. They can walk. But all of those are far greater um, opportunities for them to make it home safely than the other alternatives. Um, because if they engage in this behavior and they operate a motor vehicle, um, they're going to go possibly by ambulance, possibly by a police car, or they could be in the back of a hearse being hauled away from the scene. The state of North Carolina participates in Vision Zero. It's, this is one of their announcements that they've made. A ride share home, the average cost is $17. A DWI conviction, on average, ranges from $9,000 to $15,000 when you factor in the cost for court, for having attorneys, for the assessments and treatment that they are ordered to receive, community service costs, and everything uh, and to include insurance premiums. When you factor that in, ride share, Taxi cab is far better, and you can make that trip many more times than you can for just one single DWI conviction. And again, that's an individual choice. Departmentally, our DWI enforcement efforts uh, and statewide, North Carolina in 2016, officers charged driving while impaired 6, 6, 61,897 times. In Winston-Salem, uh, our police officers made 1,399 DWI arrests in 2016. As of yesterday, the Winston-Salem Police Department had made 706 driving while impaired arrests. Uh, the Forsyth County Dr uh, DWI Task Force, uh, since its inception in the fourth quarter of 2010, has made over 4,000 DWI arrests. The task force is comprised of uh, currently seven officers and a sergeant. Uh, whenever this, uh, the task force was uh, founded, it had five officers and a sergeant. Uh, we are proactively enforcing the law, and we want people to know that if you make this choice, 
sooner or later you will be caught and you will be uh, charged with driving while impaired if you make the decision to operate a vehicle after consuming alcohol um, or consuming drugs that causes you to be impaired. It's completely preventable, all of these losses, all of these decisions. Another initiative through the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program, they put it out, don't drink and drive. You are smarter than that. And we know that members in our community uh, have the opportunity prior to going out and engaging in these kind of behaviors, whether they're drinking socially or doing whatever, they can make a plan prior to going out to have an opportunity to have a ride. And there's so many opportunities now um, with the ride share services that are within our city uh, to include uh, public transportation, calling a friend, or taking a cab. And this should never occur, uh, someone choosing to drive while impaired. What can our uh, members of our community do? do? <clears throat> they can plan ahead. They can make sure that they have a sober ride prior to driving. If you're hosting an event, we want people in our community, as people gather here in the summer months, uh, having uh, social events at their homes uh, within their community, we want them to know that they can choose to collect keys if they're going to have people drinking at their event. They can serve a lot of food. Um, having food on hand assists people so that they're not just drinking alcoholic beverages, they can uh, eat food and, and help them with that. Also offer non-alcoholic drinks. Have a responsible bartender if you have a bartender at your event. Make sure that they're not over serving your guests um, with so much alcohol that they're not safe or in a condition that they should be driving. And also plan to stop serving alcoholic beverages long before the event ends. That will hopefully allow the person to metabolize the alcohol and be in a better condition to where uh, if they choose to drive, they're not doing it illegally and endangering their life and everyone else's. Conclusion, zero is our goal. As an agency, no traffic fatality is acceptable. We want to see that number be zero. Um, it's um, difficult on everyone. It, it taxes uh, resources. It's something that sticks with our personnel having to respond to these collisions and certainly seeing the devastation and destruction that occurs amongst family, friends, whenever the notification is made that someone has lost their life because of a completely preventable action and choice on the part of an individual. With your help as members of the media and members of our community, uh, we can make greater strides toward reaching the goal of having zero traffic fatalities within our community, especially those involving uh, people who choose to drive while they're impaired. At this time, I'll open the field uh, floor up to questions, should anyone have any. Um, if not, um, I'd like to turn it back over to Chief Roundtree uh, for closing remarks. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Officer Hanks. Thank you, every, everyone, for being here today. I'm Sergeant Krawczak with the Winston-Salem Police Department Traffic Enforcement Unit. Our unit is responsible for investigating all the fatalities that occur in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In 2017, we had 19 fatalities, as you, as you heard from Officer Hanks during his presentation. Eleven of those fatalities, alcohol, drugs, were factors in those fatalities. Five of those fatalities, speed was a factor. And then three of those fatalities, speed, alcohol, and or drugs, were factors in those fatalities. So we're here to ask the media, the citizens of Winston-Salem, for your help. What are we doing as citizens in Winston-Salem, citizens in the triad, what are we doing to prevent further fatalities occurring in 2017? What can we do? Are we re being responsible adults? Are we taking certain steps, responsibilities for our actions? What are we doing? I can tell you the fatalities that have occurred are not because of the lack of effort by the police department. As you heard from Officer Hanks, we've made numerous DWI arrests in 2016, 2017. We as an agency have issued over 5,400 speeding tickets this year. 
The D DWI task force are out there daily looking for drunk drivers. We're taking certain initiatives out here monthly, DWI checkpoints, uh, satur saturation patrols out here on our cities, or on our streets in the city of Winston-Salem. So we're doing our efforts. We ask the citizens and the media to put that out and get that, that message out there that yes, alcohol and speed and drugs are killing us out here on the streets. Does anybody have any questions thus far from the media? That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Krozak and Officer uh, Hanks for those presentations. I just have a few uh, updates for upcoming events that the police department will be involved in. On uh, tomorrow morning, we will be hosting uh, Coffee with a Cop. It will occur at Starbucks, 605 uh, Jonestown Road, uh, 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 uh, a.m. The public, uh, we ask the public to come out. This is a time where you can sit down, have a cup of coffee with a police officer. You can talk about any, uh, anything that you want to talk to the police officers about. So please come out. On uh, July the 19th, uh, the police department will be having a promotional ceremony. Uh, we will be promoting several employees to uh, higher positions in the police department. Uh, this will occur again on Ju July the 19th at 4 p.m. at the Dash Stadium and the public is welcome to attend. Uh, prior to our next uh, public safety news conference, uh, we will have a national night out. Of course, this is a national event that started in 1984. Uh, this is a time when the community and the police uh, come together uh, and stand together to raise aware awareness about crime issues in our community. So we do ask all communities, uh, community watch groups, uh, to participate in all neighborhoods. The host, the host site for Winston-Salem this year, this year will be at 1010 uh, Hutton Street. And the last thing, uh, the police department is still recruiting. We're recruiting for sworn positions and non-sworn positions. We're recruiting for police officers, and we're also recruiting for positions in our records division and our communications division. So if you are listening, we ask, and you are interested uh, in serving with the best agency in the United States, we ask that you apply at our recruiting unit. Uh, you can call 336-773-7925. Or either you can call toll free 1 877 777 WSPD. Thank you for your time. At this time, this will conclude the July uh, Public Safety News Conference. Thank you for coming. <laughs>